<laughs> so um, that's what happened at, at at that point. I mean, that's that, that's uh, that's what happened at the little campfire thing. And then I'll I'll tell you one more one more thing, and then I'll I'll let you ask the questions. Uh, but uh, so so what we did then is um, Ricardo wanted uh, everyone to go out into the middle of this field, and of course it's night now, and it is very very dark. Uh, so we went out and we held hands, and um, I'll just tell you like it is. Uh, Paula went into physical shock. She was so terrified that um, she couldn't speak. Um, she could barely move. She was shaking. Uh, I took my coat off. I put my arms around her, and I walked her out to the field. And she was literally in shock. She did not want to do this. And she was absolutely mortified, terrified. And so we went out into the field, and we all held hands. And Ricardo did this um, uh, kind of a, almost a ceremony with the cube. And um, it's this uh, energy cube, I believe they called it a tesseract or something similar to a tesseract. And um, it was interesting because standing there in the field, it was was pretty chilly, but I can remember heat passing from hand to hand. It was very interesting. And as terrified as Paula was and as locked up in shock, physical shock, um, I did feel that heat come right through her hand. It was really fascinating. And um, and so at a certain point, um, Ricardo said that they were going to go down to the forest. He did, then asked everyone else uh, to return to the little campfire area and to concentrate on what they had to do, what Ricardo and his group were going to do down in the forest. So he had asked them to go, you know, back, everyone to go back down. And then um, and the, while the rest of them went uh, to the woods. Okay, so do you join the people to the woods, or do you go back? I did neither. <laughs> I did neither, because Paula was uh, in such a in such bad shape physically. Um, somebody had the foresight to pick up a folding chair and bring that with us to the field, and uh, they set that up. She didn't ultimately didn't sit in it. She just stood, but that chair was sitting there, and. Um, uh, Ricardo and Sol and Paula kind of led the way and then uh, there was Mercedes Raimundo um, Deborah from Mexico sweet lovely woman I think uh, they were dating Raimundo was dating her at the time um, and this guy that was the interpreter um, <laughs> I uh, I was I so badly wanted to go. I, I could barely restrain myself, but I kept wondering what um, cosmic good manners were, you know? Yeah. And and I, I kept thinking, okay, yeah, you bet I could go wiggle my way in there, but I, I'm, I'm not invited. I'm not invited. So I did have the audacity. Once everybody returned to the field, I thought to myself, well, Ricardo said what he said in Spanish. I didn't understand only half of it, you know. So I think I'll just sit here in this chair in the middle of the field all by myself in the pitch black. <clears throat> so that's uh, so that's where I wound up staying. So I was um, maybe halfway between, well, I was directly out of, across from this camp. I couldn't, we were so far, I couldn't see the camp Um but I could hear them chanting, and it was beautiful. They were chanting, and um, but I had a direct line of sight to where everybody else had gone in the direction where they'd gone into the woods. I couldn't see them. It was so pitch black that once they got 20 feet from me, I could hear them walking. I could hear twigs and dirt or whatever, things on the ground breaking as they walked, but I couldn't see them. And that field, uh, it would have had twigs and it would have had grass, a few little you know, things that you could have heard while you were walking on it, but there were, again, no trees. So I, I stayed there uh, in the middle of the field. I sat in the chair, and I relaxed, and I, and I watched. So that's, that's how I wound up in the middle of the field and why I did not go back and to the camp. So, so you, you, you don't see anything? How long does this take? take place before they start coming back then oh no I saw something oh okay 
Oh yeah, I saw something. <laughs> okay. So as I as I sat there, um, I my my first thought was after they had walked off, and uh, Ricardo really took the lead there with Paula. Uh, he was kind of guiding her, and she was again she was just absolutely rigid. I mean I I've known her for years. I've never seen her that locked up, and, but he kind of guided her out. Soul followed right behind them, and then there was this group of one, two, three, four. Oh my goodness, were there five people? I'm trying to remember every single person that was in that group. So I sat there, and after they'd wandered off, I sat there, and I, I, I thought to myself, oh no, there, there must be a camper, right in the area that were straight exactly where they're headed, and the reason I thought that Grant was because as I sat there, there was this very tall pine tree that was illuminated all the way up the pine tree in a soft, hueish blue mm. kind of a color. Okay. And, um, and, and the one thing that I did connect that this to was um, it was the same color that, um, of an object that I first saw in 2009 which was right over the mountains. When you were at Bart's house, those 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 homes right there, they all sit right at the foot of the McDowell's. Mm -hmm. I was I was at home and I saw my. This is how I got involved in this whole thing. I saw an object appear, the same color, the same bluish, and to me it's a star blue. It's a star starlight blue. Uh, it was the same color, and that's I made this mental note that wow, that's interesting. It's the same bluish color, but I my only my only thought was because I had no experience with these people and what they were doing, I thought that they're headed right into somebody's camp because I see the bluish light that kind of seems to creep up the tree. Then, to the right of that, as I looked, I could, uh, there were a lot of trees, but I could kind of see into the trees because the forest floor was illuminated with a blanket, like a, like a, I don't want to say hazy, uh, Grant, when you've never seen the shape or texture or of a thing before, it's really hard to put that into words to articulate it. I, but it was a, it was more than a carpet, because it came up, it came up off the ground, but it was a, a blanket, a thick blanket, if you will, of a bluish, bluish light, and then. And then, as I sat there in the dark, and I began to kind of relax my eyes. I could see sparkles of light in the dark trees. Now the trees were black; uh, they would have been a black um, outline or um, uh, just shadows. The, the trees were shadows, but I could see them outlined, except for this area where that blue light went up the tree and then the blue blanket carpet thing on the on the floor. But those lights weren't very bright, so they didn't illuminate out. So the rest of the trees seemed to be silhouetted. That's the word I was looking for, a silhouetted black. And in that silhouetted black, I could see dense little sparkles of light, like little little, little sparkles of energy. And what it reminded me of was the fairy tales that I'd heard of as a kid were fairies. And I mean, I, I don't think it was anything like that. I mean, that's not what I thought it was. But I thought, oh my gosh, how, how magical does that look? Because I could see the little sparkles of energy um, and it would have been between where I was and, and the forest, but I could see it sparkles. And and late and and I, I won't jump ahead, but but later Paula uh, made the same comment. She said, "Look, it's alive! It's alive! The forest is alive!" Mm -hmm. And I said, "What do you mean?" And she said, "Look at the sparkles." And I said, "Yeah, I've been noticing those for some time." So so that 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 was what I witnessed, Grant. That's what I saw, <clears throat> and that's what I saw from. From a from a distance. Uh, the only other thing that occurred while I sat there was um, some person. And at the time, I didn't know who it was, but a person walked from the direction of this little camp where the chants were coming. They were coming from, and they walked right past me. The person probably could not have seen me until they literally got up on me, but they walked right past me and walked um, straight. Uh, into the forest at a perpendicular angle from where these folks had gone into the woods. 
So he had walked straight out. And when he when he walked by me, he looked like he was in a trance. It looked like, uh, my goodness, he looked like, as, as he got past me, I could see his face adequately. And he uh, he looked like he was in a hypnagogic state. I I you know and, and and I was actually quite worried. I thought I don't know who that is. I don't know what he's doing. Later, I did find out who it was, and um, I kind of found out what he what he was doing. Um, but it kind of alarmed me at the time. And, so what was uh, he doing? So that, uh, he was uh, it was Diego Barrera uh, from. Where's Diego? Oh, Diego lives in um, he lives in Miami now. But he he had felt, he felt called. He said um, after after these people had come back and we were all regrouped, I told Ricardo. I said, Ricardo, I said I'm very concerned. I said you guys were out there, and I said some person walked right past me, and I, I admitted. I said I stayed in the field. I didn't go back like you instructed, but this person walked straight past me, went out into the field. Well, that person happened to be standing right there when I told him, and. It was Diego. He said, oh, Tom, that was me. He said, I felt called to go. I felt called to go. And and then I, I questioned. I said, what did you do? What did you see? So I, I was just curious. And so what did he see? Because I know who you're talking about. We actually talked to him. I actually... Okay. He was one of the few people well, I he talked told to. Me, yeah. Yeah. At the time, he told me, I, he, I said, well, I said, you didn't go in the direction that they went in. Um, I, I know where they went, and you went at a 90-degree angle into some other woods, and he said, yes. He said, I did. I walked back into those woods, and I circled back around, and I, I was kind of standing on the other side. And he admitted to me that he'd seen the same people. He'd seen them from another angle. The beings, you mean? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's, um, I, 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 you know, I, I've gotten to know him a little bit. He's, uh, I've seen him at several events like this, and I, I can say he's, he's, he's a pretty solid guy. He's, he's, a, he's a good, good person. Um, uh, but I was, I was quite surprised, you know, I, he just simply felt called to go and that's what he was doing. Right. So I sat there, Grant, in the field, if you want me to continue on yeah, with yes, what yes, happened yes. next. Yes. Yeah. So I sat in the field, uh, it was, oh my goodness, I lost track of time. Uh, you know, Grant, uh, to, to have seen this craft over our heads and I was very clearly able to relate this craft back to one week before seeing it in Crestone, Colorado, over us at the Stupa. I mean, I recognized it. Mm -hmm. And to, to realize that these were other people, uh, they were an advanced, obviously more advanced at least technologically than we were. They were sitting in the sky above us. And then to be sitting in the field and then to be looking at these lights with just wonder, I mean, just awe. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt quite calm um, just sitting there looking at what I was seeing, so I, I, I would I would have estimated about twenty minutes to have passed, and I heard crunching again, crunch, 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 and uh, out of the forest comes Mercedes, and it comes the oh this guy I can't remember his name. And he and I talked for a long time. I just. Um, he and I talked for a quite a few, a quite a number of times following that event into 2016. Mm -hmm. And um, but anyway, um, so he came back, and um, and uh, and the others came back, and I I met them immediately because I was absolutely I wanted a I wanted to know exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. B I wanted to know what they saw, and C. I wanted to ask them individually because I wanted corroboration exactly. and I wanted independent witness um, assessment of everything that they had seen. Exactly. I grabbed every one of them, every one of them, oh, wow. Grant. Wow. And they each told me the exact same thing. Now, the one thing about um, the, I call him the architect, uh, the one thing about him, he came back and his face was glowing. He was like... A, a child at, at, who had just experienced his first Christmas, who just saw Santa Claus, and he looked at me and he said, "Tom, people exist from other planets." Now, Grant, remember, he'd come there as a novice. I mean, he just came there to kind of learn, and he kind of inserted himself into that group, and then walked right out there. And now coming back, he's just saying, "Tom, they exist." And I and he was uh, one of the first of that the first group that came back because Ricardo and Paola came back 
afterwards alone, walking behind the group, and Soul would have been with the first the first group um, that, that walked out of the woods. And so, um, uh, but you know, he 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 said they they exist. They're real. I saw them. People exist from other places. They were there. They were there. They were there. He was just so calm and elated and excited and amazed and in awe. It was like he had just seen God. I mean, it was incredible. So I, I, I got I got down. I, I, I got a download from him on what he'd seen mm-hmm. and the beings that he'd seen. And then I asked the others in the group, Mercedes, Saul, they each independently told me the exact same thing. And they weren't that far away. I mean, in the daylight, the next day, I could see where I'd been sitting. And there was this little log, which I think Paula and certainly I used as a measurement mm-hmm. of, of of where they'd gone and how far they'd gone. And I know they'd stepped over the log and got into the forest and so forth. It wasn't that far from where I was sitting. So they didn't have a lot of time coming back, you know, to to hallucinate a story, to, you know, to, to create a story. They didn't have a lot of time mm-hmm. to do that. And they all came back just calm. But I particularly remember the architect guy being so in awe, just in awe. And the rest were so calm. They were so used to it that they were, they were all happy. And, but they all told me the same thing. They all told me they saw this, 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 and this. And then, um, so I, 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 I quickly s- spoke to one or two of them there. They caught the remainder of them at the camp later because Paolo and Ricardo then came next, following by at least several minutes, maybe five minutes, they came walking up behind. Now, Paula, instead of being rigid and terrified and afraid, was relaxed and warm and calm. <laughs> she was very, um, very, 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 a very different person. And, um, and so I was able to say, what happened? What did you see? And it was exactly what they had seen, and um, it was it was pretty incredible. It was just pretty incredible. So I mean, I I can continue with what they told me they saw, mm-hmm. a- absolutely, and and I'll and I'll share with you what they told me at the time. And as as time went on, um, a, a few of the inconsequential details seemed to shift a little bit, but I I kind of chalk that up to just lapse in human memory it just it just tends to happen yeah. but um but the structure was always there nothing varied in the structure mm-hmm. so so what i was told was that Antorell was standing there and and i i'm i'm a little at odds of how much to share of paula's experience um because she really did remain pretty private about that i mean she put her work first her work was her work was first and um she kind of put her own experience aside, which I found to be pretty selfless, actually. Okay. I was at, okay. Yes, I yeah, I was on the next I was on the next hotel room. Yeah, we we met at breakfast, and that 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 unfolded. So so if Paula has spoken publicly about this, then I then I don't mind, yeah. you know, because I, I I just I want to be respectful of her experience. Yeah. But um, so um, so so you know what they all told me was that Aunt Terrell was standing there, and um. And it was almost as if they had um, holographically projected that down to the ground, mm-hmm. um, but they were standing there. And from the way they described it, it was completely uh, compatible with what I'd seen with the bluish lights, uh, you know. With uh, and so I, I, I made the assumption um, because of what they'd said in talking about this thing called a zendra that this this carpet, bluish carpet type thing that I'd seen to the right of this light that kind of trickled up the tree um, was the Zindra. That was a Zindra. And, uh, and then, <clears throat> so what they told me was that uh, Ricardo and Paula walked ahead of them. Uh, Ricardo told them to stop about where the log was. Okay, and then Paula is. and, Ri- yeah, so Paula and Ricardo walked further into the forest and they actually sent Raimundo first. Raimundo walked into the forest and that he came back saying, they're there, they're there, they're there, they're there. And uh, I'm not sure what where Raimundo's positioning was. I don't know if he went back to the log or if he stood there with Paola and and uh, Ricardo. Was, I was unclear on that. But um, what they all saw from the log and from Paula and Ricardo's position, uh, uh, Antorell was there. And um, uh, there were two other additional people. 
and uh, it, it kind of varied, and I don't know if this, uh, the description of them varied, and I don't know if it was because of the perspective, where they were people were positioned or not, but um, uh, people initially told me that the, the, there were two other beings uh, there with Antarell, and they were, uh, they were more human-sized, more, more like us, and then uh, there was um, one other a, a person who was very short in stature, maybe three and a half, four feet tall, and <clears throat> he was standing behind a tree, kind of peeking out, but he had a countenance that was very friendly, very affable, very um, inviting. And um, and the architect actually told me that the communication that he got from him was one of just joy and delight, that this person was so delighted um, to be there. And that the communication that he got at the time was uh, was that he was, uh, this person was so excited that they were there and they, he was so excited, I call him a he because that's, I think, how he was referred to, but, uh, but he was uh, so excited for the day to come when this occurrence, this face-to-face -face stuff, could be more common. But this, this person was just filled with joy. And he, would, he was, and I, and I questioned extensively, I said, was this a gray? No, it wasn't a gray. But it was kind of more in that direction than human. Mm -hmm. um, but, but very, very friendly and very nice and very, very short, very small. Um, mm -hmm. but, but not so gray alien looking. Uh, it was just different. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two people that were... Um, that were uh, there were the human sized people. Uh, it was reported to me that they were um, very human looking. And then, of course, there was Antarell, who appeared to be about 10 feet tall. Uh, 